Okay, hello everyone. Uh, again, we are continuing this course, NPTEL course on advanced reinforced concrete design, and uh, uh, we are talking about durability aspects in reinforced concrete design. And in the last two lectures, uh, we talked about the importance of durability, and we started discussing uh, different concrete uh, deterioration mechanisms. Uh, we'll continue uh, in this chapter. Uh, in this lecture, actually, we are going to discuss the uh, deterioration mechanisms, uh, including physical, mechanical, and corrosion-related aspects. Okay, and in the next part of the uh, this module, we'll talk about design approaches and what are the core provisions that consider the durability design. Right? Yes. Let's get started. Um, so the expected learning outcomes from this uh, module uh, is the student should be able to explain different. Uh, physical and mechanical attacks on concrete and their effects and also how we can uh, reduce or prevent their meshes and uh, explain the corrosion in uh, rebar and the corrosion mechanisms and also their types and what is the effect of corrosion on the concrete structure and how uh, we can prevent or reduce the effects of corrosion. So these are uh, the expected learning outcomes after the student has seen this part of this video. Right. So, uh, the last class also we have given this overview. Uh, concrete undergoes deterioration either through mechanical, physical, or chemical actions. And in the last uh, part of the video, we talked about chemical action, which is alkali aggregate reaction and sulfate attack. In this uh, video, we are going to talk about physical uh, aspects that leads to concrete deterioration, which is freeze and thaw. And also, we will talk about mechanical and other corrosion related issues. Okay. So, why is it freeze and thaw is important? Okay, so if you look at it, um, uh, India also, a uh, country uh, which is a la large country, uh, you can have cold climate uh, and the temperature can go below less than 4 degrees centigrade, especially at high altitude areas. And sometimes in some regions, you can also have temperatures as low as. 30 for less than 35 degrees centigrade negative during the night okay so you can see in the climatic region you have this upper northern part which is under uh, designated as a very cold region in the climatic map of india similarly you have in the northeast you have in some pockets like this and then you have some pockets like this in the south also where you can have temperature that can go less than zero degrees centigrade okay so there are some regions which can be subjected to cold climate where the freeze and thaw effect may play a role okay so in these kind of regions only few months are available to work at the site so it also puts a lot of pressure on construction schedule and uh, along with low temperature especially in high altitude areas the wind also can play a role and also the diurnal variation that means the daily variations in the temperature also can be quite high so these things will play a role in concrete deterioration mechanism due to uh, freeze and thaw okay so uh, again you know we have seen this uh, we have uh, uh, several locations where we have hilly hilly regions like this where we do build infrastructure uh, as you know in the north as well as in the northeast uh, government has been putting a lot of focus on uh, building the infrastructure so uh, and you have these kind of snow clad mountain and then you know these kind of regions and uh, from army and military point of view also uh, we have a lot of bunkers and other facilities that need to be created at high altitude so it puts a lot of uh, uh, restrictions uh, and constraints on construction and also if you do it we have to do it properly so that the effect, the damage effect due to freeze and thaw is going to be uh, marginal or it can be avoided. Okay. Now let us see what is this freeze and thaw uh, mechanism. And uh, we all know that I think uh, when the temperature falls below 0 degree centigrade, water can convert itself into ice. And water converts itself into ice. We know that the volume expands by about 9 percentage, 9 to 10 percentage. So you see, the 10 percentage increase in volume is quite a bit, right? And uh, we, we are talking about the water that is getting converted into ice inside the concrete. So 
it's in a constrained environment and when this volume expansion happens it's going to increase the pressure by approximately 13 megapascal and you can see in this figure okay the same small uh, less than this capacity of this bottle when it temperature reduces and you can see that the volume expands uh, sometimes you may also you must have seen uh, that if you keep your canned uh, 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 cold drinks that can also sometimes it can actually uh, volume can expand it can lead to crack also you must have seen it if you keep in your freezer right now why is this important um, so freezing is when the temperature goes below uh, zero degrees centigrade the freezing starts and thawing means when you start again heating it up or when the temperature goes up again the ice will convert itself into water now when i when the concrete specimens were subjected to different freeze and thaw cycles uh, people have found that the damage keeps growing. For example, this is uh, one of the uh, tests uh, which was not subjected to any cyclic presenta. And you can see that due to this expansion, you have these kind of cracks that are uh, forming, right? Now, if you keep undergoing the cycles of loading, that means heating it up and cooling it up, and uh, what will happen is you will have more damage that will be happening. So the damaged portion area is going to keep increasing. So when the damage area is going to keep increasing, it will attract more water inside uh, those uh, cracks and damages. Then again, at those locations, again, when the ice is, uh, or the water is converting to ice or in some form of solid uh, form, uh, then, you know, it's going to create some hydraulic pressure. Uh, especially not the ice the expansion it will create problem uh, you will have also have water that is below when the ice is expanding the water below will start ex putting pressure on the surrounding concrete so uh, this process will keep continuing and if i increase the cycle to 600 cycles of freeze and thaw cycles then you can see that the damage clearly keeps increasing and uh, so you can see from n is equal to 0 to n is equal to this is n is equal to basically uh, 1800 that what you are looking at and this is n is equal to 1200 is what we are looking at so you can see that the damage area is keep increasing when i have the cyclical prison thaw loading that is getting into the system okay and then all of them can interconnect and it can lead to more damage right so uh, why is that it is happening these damages it is basically arising from expansion of pore water during freezing process, right? And then uh, usually, uh, we, you know, we are talking about what is this expansion that is happening inside the concrete. So uh, concrete, we know that we have a lot of dissolved ions that are present in the concrete. So uh, the water will not really quickly freeze when the temperature goes below zero degree centigrade. So uh, in fact, water in different pore sizes freeze at different temperatures. Depending upon the size of the pore, uh, it doesn't really quickly uh, uh, freezes. It is going to freeze at different temperature depending upon where that water is located. For example, water in 10 nanometer pores will not freeze until negative 5 degrees centigrade. And water in 3.5 nanometer will not freeze until negative 20 degrees centigrade. The gel water will not freeze until minus 78 degrees centigrade. So you know that gel water is a water that is occupied within the calcium silicate hydrate gels, right? So that cannot freeze when the temperature goes uh, uh, up to minus 78, point, uh, 78 degrees centigrade. And also again, when you start heating it up uh, or when you when the temperature goes down, uh, the, the process of water converting into ice it does not happen very quickly it, uh, at a particular sudden temperature, especially inside the concrete. It is going to occur progressively over a temperature range. Okay? And uh, the formation of less than solid and the persistence of, because you know, wherever you have colder uh, uh, temperature, where quickly the ice will form, but however, the layers below will still may remain in the form of liquid form. So this ice expansion will create additional pressure on the liquid which in turn creates hydraulic pressure on the surrounding uh, concrete and then it creates to uh, tensile cracking so this pressure from volume change products is what it creates tensile cracking in concrete now with the illustration we can see what happens okay so for example this is a water that you know i have just kept 
a schematic of a water, but you imagine that this water is sitting inside the concrete, right? Now, when the temperature starts going down like this, okay, so the water starts uh, cooling and then it can freezes, it can freeze and then uh, the water can change into ice, right? And then again, uh, because of this uh, conversion from water to ice, it expands in volume. We have seen that 9 to 10 percentage of expansion is possible. And then again, when the temperature starts uh, increasing, it starts heating it up, the ice will start melting, okay? And then the ice will convert again into water. So this cycle will keep forming. And in this process, if you have more cracks, then it can attract more water and then it can aggravate the, uh, the uh, damage cycle. All right, so this is again another uh, illustration to explain what we have discussed just now. And let's say, you know, you have a concrete and you have all these are uh, basically voids, okay? So these are all these are voids. You have multiple voids of uh, scales that are available. And then somehow if you have pores that are interconnected and then water is able to go and occupy all these uh, pores, then let's say if the temperature is going to reduce and if it goes below, sub zero degree centigrade then you can have volume increase because of that uh, water converting into ice then it is going to put a lot of pressure on the surrounding concrete and then when the tensile stresses exceeds the tensile in the concrete you have these kind of cracks okay that's what you see okay everywhere and when this cycle keeps going now that you have cracks again it can attract more water from external environment and then this process will keep continuing and you'll have more and more damage okay so that is what we are uh, looking at it from uh, this uh, schematic uh, we have let's say uh, initially uh, you have uh, this as the volume of water let's say okay and uh, when it freezes again it expands in volume it creates pressure and then again when you uh, heat it up it thaws and then it becomes uh, ice becomes uh, liquid now that you have additional cracks, then again more water can come in and it can fill, right? And then again, when it converts itself into ice, again you will have more crack forming, like you see, you know, this additional crack that has come. And then this process will keep continuing, and then you will have finally this kind of a major large crack widths and more damage. Okay, so this is the effect of alternate heating and cooling. Okay, when uh, the water converts to ice and then ice again converts back to water. In this process, you have cracks and then these cracks will become passages for additional water to enter in the system and then you'll have more and more damage. So there is a progressive failure of a specimen due to freeze and thaw cycle. Now this also, if you have aggregates that are very close to the surface, sometimes the water can get inside the pores of the aggregate also and then it can also uh, lead to popping out of this aggregate also. So that is also possible. Okay. Right, so this is a, uh, some of the damages from uh, the literature. You can see clearly the scaling effect uh, in the structure and then you end up with these kind of D type of cracking. Okay, So why this is called as D is basically it resembles the letter D and usually you will have in these kind of D type of cracking in payments uh, very close to that of this uh, joints Okay, uh, where due to this freeze and thaw effect you end up having this kind of D type of cracking due to Presenta, and also you can see a lot of internal cracking like this. Okay, so all these things are because of the presenta effect. Okay, so uh, it is, it is, uh, it can play a major role, and because of this cracking, again, it can lead to other deterioration mechanisms. Okay, uh, even if you have steel as a reinforcement, then you know when the moisture is available, it will start corroding quickly also. Right. Now, how do we tackle this region effect? One is the use of air entraining agents. So basically what we do is uh, we, during the mixing process itself, we add admixtures like air entraining agents that will create small air bubbles, which will be dispersed throughout the concrete. So then what happens is when the water converts itself into ice, then it will push that uh, other water that is yet to uh, become ice into the other pore regions, which are closer to each other in that way the expansive stresses will be limited and then you will have less cracking. So that is the idea. Now this is, uh, people have measured after adding air and training agent, what happens to relative dynamic modulus. If the dynamic modulus is measured through 
usually non-destructive testing methods. You can see that as a measure of your stiffness of the uh, concrete. And you can see that for the control concrete without air entraining agent, in the x-axis what I have is a presentho cycle that like what we have seen in the previous slides. And as the number of presentho cycles increases, you can see that the dynamic relative dynamic modulus is increasing. In fact, for about 150 presentho cycle, you can see that the relative dynamic modulus of a control specimen without any any air entraining agent has reduced as low as 20%. So that you can see the 20% reduction in your modulus is going to be very significant from uh, serviceability point of view, right? And uh, and you see the same specimen when it is added with air entraining agent, which is shown in this uh, white circle. You can see that there is no reduction in dynamic modulus or a very very marginal or minor uh, reduction in your dynamic modulus with increase in three sample cycle. Because what are the expansion that is happening? It is it is able to be mitigated by those air entraining agents, uh, which are voids that are there that is able to create a passage for this water to go and occupy the volume. That way, it is not going to reduction in crack. And you can see this is again a durability factor with respect to air content that people have seen. Usually, air entraining agents uh, from 2 to uh, 4 percentage, they add it to the concrete, which is, subject, which is prone to freeze and thaw effect. And you have concrete that is made up of different strength, 20, 30, 40, and 50, and so on. And you see here, uh, the moment I start adding uh, air entraining agent, you can clearly see that for all types of concretes, the durability factor increases. Okay, so that means when there is no uh, air entraining agent which is subjected to um, freeze and thaw effect, you can see that it is the durability factor is very low. So higher the durability factor, better is your performance of the uh, concrete. So you can see. The moment we start adding about two and a half to three percent, the durability factor remains close to 95 or 100. Okay, so in that way, by adding air entrainment, we can reduce the or negate the effect of presenta. Right. So now uh, uh, we we have discussed about this physical aspect, which is presenta. Now we'll get into the uh, another deterioration mechanism of concrete, which is basically uh, due to abrasion and Erosion, as the name indicates, it's a mechanical form of deterioration mechanism. And uh, let's look at what is abrasion. And abrasion uh, is a dry attrition uh, that usually occurs in occurs in pavements and industrial floors by vehicular traffic. Okay, so what you see here is also uh, it is because of the repeated rolling of the wheel. We know that. Uh, it's going to create a lot of frictional stresses on the surface of the pavements because of this uh, uh, rolling uh, load uh, from the vehicle. And also, you can see here, uh, you you know, airports, runways are subjected to heavy uh, loads due to this landing and takeoff of uh, the vehicle, especially the landing. You can see the kind of debris that are coming out when uh, you know the the flight is. Uh, landing on the airport runway. So that creates uh, damage due to abrasion and uh, and also it is aggravated by uh, debris that are there in the uh, particles due to friction. These uh, debris can come and uh, collide with the surface and uh, it can create more damage. And similarly also sometimes these debris also which is occupied in this water particle and then when the vehicle is going they can generate localized uh, heavy impact so the debris in the water particle can fall from a particular height and it can create a impact a localized impact that can also over a period of time when it is subjected to cumulative impact uh, such impacts then the surface damages will start happening this is what we call that as an abrasion uh, okay all right. Now, what are the effects of abrasions? Again, we can see here when you have these kind of repeated uh, rolling uh, load and that creates this kind of uh, rutting and these kind of localized damages. And uh, and also this happens in spillways and all. Uh, again, you can see the, uh, the degradation and, uh, and here also uh, you can see that clearly the concrete in the surface has come out and even the rebars are visible that uh, tells uh, how significant that effect can be abrasion effect can be in in terms of deteriorating the concrete performance 
Now erosion is again another mechanical action and it is again deterioration by surface wear and uh, the erosion is result of particles moving in the water which are scrubbing the surface. Okay, So the particles especially this is erosion when we say uh, it, it, it happens in spillways of dams and water lines where when the water is moving it also carries a lot of debris at a particular you know at a, at a good velocity when these particles start rubbing against the surface of this uh, canals and uh, spillways then you have erosion uh, happening okay so it the wear happens by abrasive action containing solid particles which are in suspension because when the fluid is moving of course the particles are going to be in suspensions so that is going to create this uh, surface wear mechanism which is called erosion okay and it usually happens in canal lining spillways and pipes that we have seen uh, we, are, we are seeing in these kind of images right so this is another uh, very interesting phenomena which is the cavitation now uh, cavitation can occur in uh, these kind of dams and spillways when your curvature of the spillway changes quite uh, abruptly right then uh, there is a phenomena called cavitation that occurs and uh, this occurs in location where there is a rapid development and dissipation of the air bubbles okay so in fact uh, you will have because of the low pressure regions that are created water will converts itself into water vapor and then this formation of this low pressure region it will create a lot of these air bubbles and then these air bubbles also will collapse when it is collapsing it will create a localized a high velocity jet of water that will create uh, damages this phenomena is called as cavitation and again this is the figure uh, illustration uh, from the literature you can see that the dam and this is your gate where this is your water okay and uh, when the uh, when the gate is opened again you know you are going to have this flow and uh, now this is the area because there is a change in geometry which is susceptible to cavitation. Now, why this cavitation uh, comes? We will explain that. Uh, it creates this circulation debris that uh, causes additional abrasion and damage. So, this is what it happens. And now, let's see what is cavitation. Okay. Whenever there is a curved surface like this, okay, and uh, what happens is, yeah, so when you have a curved surface like this, it uh, it creates a localized high velocity of the water particle. When the velocity suddenly increases because of the change in curvature uh, of this, uh, uh, let's say, uh, spillway, uh, what happens is it's going to create some low pressure regions, and uh, in this kind of low pressure regions, it will be created. On these low pressure regions, and what will happen is water will convert itself into uh, uh, water vapor okay so and then this water vapor uh, it will create uh, it will become uh, it will create a lot of air bubbles and these air bubbles what will happen is they will start uh, coalescing together and then also it will it will implode and when it's imploding or when it is collapsing it is going to create uh, water to jet with extreme force on the surface below this vapor that means at this location okay so that means that this location when you look at it okay so below this region at this location so just below this uh, low pressure region water will try to jet with the extreme force uh, then that will create a uh, lot of damages so this is what happens and you in the low pressure region these kind of bubbles they form and then the bubble will actually imp implode close to a fixed surface which generates a jet that's what we said below this low pressure region then you will have this kind of bubble implosion taking place that creates water below this region to exit with a high velocity that is going to create a lot of localized damages and more and more such damages happens then your curvature becomes very non-smooth and the geometry there is going to be changed again more and more low pressure zones will be created and then it will aggravate the damage mechanism so this is what happens in cavitation now how do we tackle these uh, physical mechanisms one is to use high strength concrete with uh, very small aggregates in fact if you use uh, large aggregates it, it is not good and smooth concrete surfaces with very minimal irregularities that is also another way of tackling this abrasion erosion and this cavitation 
damage mechanisms and then we can also use concrete with good aggregate paste bond that means uh, the the bonding between the cement paste and the aggregate has to be very good and it should create strong interfacial transition zones and we can also use aggregate which have very high hardness okay and you we have to do this uh, aggregate characterization properly and choose aggregates which have very good hardness that will also uh, uh, perform well and the sudden increase in this velocity of the water should be minimized so that uh, basically we can tackle only by creating a smooth uh, profile when the water is flowing okay and sometimes the purposeful aeration of concrete also helps in uh, tackling these kind of damages right so um, so we have uh, with this i think we have uh, uh, we have sufficiently covered uh, the concrete deterioration mechanisms okay uh, so which again uh, can be categorized as we have discussed mechanical physical and chemical uh, if you remember in the first part i think we discussed about alkali aggregate reaction and sulfate attack and in this uh, part of the module we talked about freeze and thaw and abrasion and erosion mechanisms and how do we uh, tackle them now we'll get into what happens to steel and we know that steel uh concrete is weak in tension so wherever tensile stresses develop we put steel and uh, there is a very good chemistry between steel and concrete because the coefficient of thermal expansion is uh, uh, nearly same so it doesn't really create uh, a lot of residual stresses and uh, steel has excellent mechanical properties it also gives ductility to reinforced concrete behavior however uh, corrosion is like uh, in some way it is like a concrete cancer and uh, people spend a lot of money in repairing uh, to tackle this corrosion related uh, damages okay and corrosion of rebar happens mainly through two mechanisms one is the carbonation induced corrosion another one is chloride induced corrosion so we will briefly talk about these two mechanisms and then what kind of preventive measures that we can take to tackle these uh, mechanisms okay so as we can see uh, corrosion is degradation of material to Uh, a reaction with its environment and uh, rebar corrodes uh, and you can see the kind of uh, damages that has happened in uh, the rebar and uh, this is a structure that is subjected to marine environment where uh, there is a possibility of ingress of moisture and also chloride and you know sea salt uh, chloride uh, can induce and it can aggravate the corrosion again you can see the kind of damages that we can have due to corrosion okay Right. so now let's see uh, what happens usually uh, uh, when the concrete is made uh, around the steel rebar uh, some localized uh, corrosions happens and then it form a thin oxide film okay and when the ph level uh, is you know around 12 to 13 it forms this nice passive film okay and usually the reinforcements are uh, passivated by this thin oxide film and it is a very stable um, uh, oxide and uh, it will basically acts as a protection barrier for the steel and uh, the but over a period of time this uh, the passivation layer is lost and it depassivates and uh, mainly because of ingress of chloride ions and ingress of your co2 that leads to carbonation of concrete because of this ph level can go uh, down to even less than 10 or sometimes even reach the level of 9 and then it can really aggravate the corrosion okay so let's see what are the basic corrosion mechanisms and we know that corrosion is an electrochemical uh, reaction and we need to have uh, cathodes and anodes forming and also electrolyte also should be uh, available and uh, uh, what happens is in the steel rebar you have both cathode and anode forming In the same steel rebar the moment you have oxygen and water that is available then this electrochemical process will start and you form a galvanic cell or corrosion cell and you have in the anodic region uh, the ion will start losing uh, electrons or ion will oxidize to fe2 plus and it will start losing this electron and then in the uh, cathodic region Uh, oxygen and water will combine with these electron to form hydroxyl uh, ions okay now this process will keep continuing then the ion will 
react with uh, water and oxygen and forms various ion hydroxide products depending upon what kind of ion hydroxide projects uh, products they form that the volume of the rust is going to increase now higher the volume of rust increase higher will be the expansive stresses that will be created to the surrounding concrete so this this is the way it forms so the moment you have supply of oxygen and uh, in fact chloride and carbon dioxide which we will discuss uh, then you this is a continuous process and it will keep happening and the rebar will start losing its area and we know that the capacities are function of what is the area of steel when the area of the steel is start reducing then your strength will go down and then your stiffness which is again function of your flexural rigidity ei the i also will start reducing then it will lead to more cracking and more deflections and more problems so this is what it happens now why is that we are concerned about this corrosion is now depending upon the level of oxidation iron can converts itself into iron oxides in iron hydroxides and you can see this iron feoh3 3h2o it occupies almost six times six to six and a half times the volume of iron okay so the rust occupies more volume than steel and depending upon what kind of what is the level of oxidation and what kind of compound that is formed the volume can increase by as high as six times over the original steel which is quite a significant volume and you know that uh, and we are talking about steel is inside the concrete so it is in a very constrained environment when the volume is uh, expanding it is going to put lot of expansive stresses on the surrounding concrete so this we need to be careful of now let's see how the stress is generated and we know that concrete is weak in tension so the concrete will start fracturing due to tensile stresses that are generated from expansive products and cracks uh, either can propagate through concrete in two different mechanism or two different uh, fracture patterns one is in like this in a single crack and it is or through this kind of a coordinated crack okay you have multiple cracks forming depending upon uh, the Uh, corrosion mechanisms and uh, how closely your rebars are placed and what is the depth of your cover and so on so multiple factors will determine whether you have a single crack or you have this kind of coordinated crack and usually single crack it's the presence of a single rust colored crack which runs along the concrete surface above the rebar in fact if you see crack that is running along in the direction of the bar then you can clearly see that it is a corrosion induced crack similarly you can also have coordinated crack and this mostly observed when a section of the concrete falls or a breaks apart and exposing the rusted rebar okay so these are the two uh, mechanisms uh, through which the concrete can crack around the rusted rebar and again depending upon what level of uh, corrosion that you are in usually we want the corrosion to initiate we want to make the concrete as impermeable as possible and also by adding some admixtures or supplementary cementitious material you densify the concrete so that the ingress of uh, moisture and oxygen or carbon dioxide or chloride doesn't happen but the moment corrosion initiates then there is a stage called propagation stage and then there is a stage called ac uh, acceleration stage so we want to make sure that the corrosion initiation stage is as long as possible but if your corrosion is initiated then you will have these kind of stains that you will see around the bars where it is because this is from the iron oxide that are leaching out that is why you have this kind of uh, uh, concrete staining and then if it keeps continuing then because of the expansive stresses then the uh, concrete will start spalling and it will create these kind of damages and you can see marine structures uh, severe degradation okay now a lot of time people think that by just by patching it up we can solve the corrosion problem actually if you don't address the corrosion and if you go for this kind of surface repair methodology the repair will not be effective in fact Uh, after some point of time that the patch repair that what is uh, done it will also come out because you are not really addressing the root cause of the problem you are just uh, giving a symptomatic uh, treatment which is not actually good practice right so now let's look at what happens because of chloride because chloride induced corrosion uh, is a major uh, factor uh, which is which can create a uh, localized or pitting corrosion so uh chlorides to other diffusion mechanisms uh, it can penetrate the concrete with the help of surface moisture like this and then uh, when moisture and oxygen is available and most of the time also if your structure is um, located in marine environment or you can also have uh, airborne induced chloride attack 
okay through that the chloride can penetrate the concrete uh, with the help of again moisture and oxygen and in the western world they also use a lot of deicing salt uh, which has which are rich in chlorides again uh, to melt the snow away so again that uh, creates a passage for entry of these chlorides into the concrete and uh, what happens is again we have discussed this chloride induced corrosion uh, starts uh, happening and uh, this mechanism is self sustained the moment it start initiating then you will have always chloride available that will uh, aggravate the corrosion mechanisms then you will have these kind of uh, rust formation and that is going to create a lot of additional stresses in the surrounding concrete then you have this kind of delamination okay and when the chloride penetrate to the level of steel then if it goes beyond the threshold value of chloride then uh, basically corrosion propagation stage will start and uh, we 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 want to make sure that the chloride is less than the threshold value to uh, propagate uh, for to limit the propagation of your corrosion now again with uh, further penetration of chlorides it can lead to further corrosion and it can lead to delamination and spalling like what we have seen here okay so uh, chloride induced corrosion is also called a spitting corrosion because it's a localized corrosion but carbonization carbonization induced corrosion is a is a more uniform corrosion which we'll talk about it in the coming slides right uh, now what happens again also chloride ingress can happen due to poor construction sometimes what happens in pavements and all we do this kind of uh, joints okay uh, either it could be from crack or it could be from construction joint and now these construction joint if they are not sealed properly uh, with some kind of a uh, flexible material uh, then what happen is you know because of the surface induced chloride the chloride can reach the level of steel rebar and then corrosion again can uh, start and uh, as we have explained when iron hydroxides are forming the volume is going to be more then the iron itself then it is going to put lot of uh, expansive stresses on the surrounding concrete then it can lead to spalling and then deep spalling when this uh, when you supply more and more chloride then again corrosion will start uh, happening at a faster pace then it can lead to more damage right so uh, we have talked uh, chloride induced corrosion now we'll see what is carbonation induced corrosion okay and we have seen especially for uh, a uh, country like in india in major metropolitan cities because of the vehicular uh, uh, traffic again always the structures especially bridges or structures which are close to the roads you know they are always exposed to carbon dioxide now what happens with the co2 when it is able to penetrate uh, inside the concrete then it can react with calcium hydroxide and it can lower the ph this is another important thing in fact when ph level goes less than 10 you know the concrete starts losing its uh, passivation and then it can aggravate uh, the corrosion right so that's what it happens so co2 can react with water and calcium hydroxide it can form calcium carbonate and water and uh, the corrosion will start taking place faster when this ph is lower because ph will start lowering when your more and more calcium hydroxide is consumed and then when calcium carbonate is formed then your uh, ph will start reduce so that is what it happens so uh, the moment you have uh, co2 and water that is getting uh, inside then again co2 will react with water it will form carbonic acid and then the carbonic acid and calcium hydroxide can react and it can form calcium carbonate and water okay so so you have the steady carbonation front that happens over a period of time because if you give more time for the CO2 to uh, permeate through uh, the concrete, then over a period of time, the carbonation front will keep going inside, more inside the concrete, and it will start lowering the pH. Now, initially, as we have seen, the good quality concrete provides pH of 12 to 13, where the steel is passivated. Now, you can see, let's say this is the ingress of your uh, CO2. Carbon dioxide enters, and then pH level will start uh, going down. Why is it going to down? Because we are using this calcium hydroxide that gives the high ph or alkalinity to the concrete that is getting more and more consumed and then you form calcium carbonate because of that the ph will start lowering and uh, drop and steel is still not affected but when the ph at steel level drops below 9.5 then the corrosion will start then the moment corrosion starts then you have this kind of volume expansion of rust that creates cracking and spalling okay so the one way to 
uh, tackle this uh, carbonation induced corrosion is not to let pH level go below a certain level or consume this calcium hydroxide by using supplementary cementation material. That is what we do, right? The calcium hydroxide is uh, reacts with silica, reactive silica present in SCM, or you move form more calcium silicate hydrogen. In that way, also we can tackle the effect of carbonation induced corrosion. Now let's see the literary evidence that is uh, people have done some experiments and they uh, find they 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 look at uh, say this is the chloride uh, diffusion coefficient and also this is the permeability that we are seeing here and as you can see uh, when you add low dosages of uh, fly ash what we are seeing is and fly ash content is in the x axis okay so what we are seeing is if you see the permeability both the chloride the diffusion uh, coefficient is also is reducing uh, uh, with respect to the amount. So we have three things. Uh, the one with uh, uh, solid circle is basically chloride binding capacity. Uh, that means it will not uh, let the free, three chlorides to be available. If it is able to bind it well, it's good. And then the permeability is, of course, lower the permeability, uh, the better will be the durability. And also the lower the value of chloride diffusion coefficient, again better is the durability. So you can see that addition of flash content uh, really helps in uh, to an extent reducing the uh, uh, permeability. But if you add too much also is not good. So that is what it is showing here, especially for this permeability when you look at it. When you have more than 40, 50 percentage, then the permeability is increasing, right? Then similarly, if you look at chloride diffusion coefficient also, it is actually increasing when fly ash is added more than 50 percent. So, optimum dosage of fly ash actually helps to reduce the permeability as well as lesser the chloride diffusion coefficient. Now, what are the other preventive measures? Of course, we know the, the simplest thing is to make your cover concrete very dense and also increase the cover so that it takes more time for the chlorides and carbon dioxide to, to reach the level of steam. Another way is to add this corrosion inhibitors. Uh, we have uh, two types of uh, uh, corrosion inhibitors are usually used, anodic inhibitor and bipolar inhibitors. So these bipolar inhibitors is uh, commonly used in the, uh, in what happens is it goes and reaches the level of steel and it creates a layer on the uh, level of steel. And then it increases the, um, uh, the polarity, the anodic and cathodic polarity. In that way, it is going to delay the uh, corrosion and uh, also it is going to uh, increase the resistivity of the concrete close to that of steel. So in that way, again corrosion will be uh, delayed. Now another way is to coat the rebar, which is called epoxy coated rebar. Again, cost is a factor. Again, corrosion inhibitors are also uh, quite a costly admixture. So we have to use it very carefully. And the simplest way to tackle corrosion is to provide a proper cover and as we have discussed in the first part of the lecture, to make the cover concrete really very good quality with uh, less permeable, uh, less permeability, right. Another way is to create, use this epoxy coated deeper. Again, it is going to add as a physical um, a barrier and it will not let uh, these uh, chlorides and CO2 to really attack the steel. And another way is to, we have talked about it in the uh, the module 2, the GFRP rebars are now being used. Of course, it has its own challenges, uh, but wherever ductility is not really a big issue, then we can definitely use the GFRP rebar, which is completely non-corrosive and uh, you can tackle the corrosion related issues. And uh, another way is to use uh, cathodic production. So what we do, we supply some uh, electric voltage uh, to the uh, rebar and uh, make the steel to act more like a uh, cathode always and then you attach some kind of a sac sacrificial anode then that will start corroding and it will protect the steel so that is called cathodic production uh, we what we do is we either by creating a, a supplying a voltage or uh, you know attaching this uh, sacrificial anode uh, you can protect the steel. Again, this is also a very costly uh, repair uh, process. Uh, one way is okay, you know, we can also add steel, the fibers, okay, synthetic fibers or uh, steel fibers. The moment it cracks, it will not let the crack to grow. And in that way, you are going to restrain the crack. In that way, you are not going to let the uh, 
the passage for uh, the entry of deleterious substance to be very free uh, because you are restraining the crackers. So these are some of the ways that with which we can tackle the corrosion. Okay, so corrosion is a subject in itself. Uh, so if you want more details, in fact, you are most uh, welcome to look at other videos and other uh, you know uh, lecture material uh, that will give you better idea of uh, different uh, aspects of corrosion. Now let's see. Uh, we have talked about this uh, physical damage, abra abrasion, erosion. And corrosion. Let's see what is the effect of these uh, deterioration mechanisms on the serviceability properties of concrete. Now we have abrasion and erosion. What happens because you have uh, loss of friction because the material is coming out, so it is going to increase the stress levels because of the loss of friction. So when you have lesser friction that is resisting load, of course you will have more stresses, and that will create uh, more uh, serviceability issues and performance issues. And freeze of the uh, attack also, again, it leads to loss of section. Again, that is going to increase in uh, stress levels. Okay? okay. And the chloride or carbonation ingress, of course, it is going to induce cracking from corrosion product formation. And uh, when your steel is lost, and you will have more uh, crack width because now less steel is uh, available to tackle the applied loads. And then you will have more cracking and more deflection because of the corrosion of reinforcement. These are the effect of these deterioration mechanisms on serviceability properties. Right. So uh, let's summarize. Uh, in this part of this uh, video, uh, we have discussed different physical and chemical deterioration mechanisms, and we also discussed uh, what is the effect on the durability and uh, preventive measures such as using supplementary cementitious material or using air and training agents specifically to tackle freeze and thaw. Uh, we discussed about that. We also briefly discussed what are the basics of corrosion and their mechanisms. And uh, corrosion happening due to chloride and carbonation was also discussed. And effect of durability, uh, you know, what are the effect of corrosion on durability, I should say, was discussed as well. And then preventive measures is also we briefly discussed to tackle this deterioration mechanisms so with this i think these are some of the uh, references you can uh, look at it if you want more details and with this uh, we are ending this uh, module uh, thank you and uh, we'll have one more part that we will discuss in the next video thank you